Sweet. Okay, so last time where we left off was uh, you guys were left with um, presentational component, a context provider, uh, the server side code, and the ability to join a room. That's that much we had done. So um, what I asked you to work on, what seems like people made some good progress on, is actual message sending functionality. So what I thought we'd do is just run quickly through a couple of different approaches to, to doing this. Um, if you guys have comments, you know, some of you guys did this and, you know, maybe you have some you know, suggestions or things as you go along. So, so feel free to jump in and, um, you know, uh, add to the commentary. So the, I'm going to talk about two different ways of doing this. I, I tried both and I, I, I kind of like the second one better, but, but I'll, I'll go through the first one first because it's a little more straightforward and it's a little maybe less magical. Uh, so in the first one, we're basically going to, you know, utilize, um, JavaScript, TypeScript's ability to map um, functions and save callbacks. And we're going to use some of the, the functionality that was set up for us, these mappings that were set up on the server. And then we'll look at a way of doing this using an event emitter, which is um, something that's um, built into JavaScript and it's sort of a, a pretty important design pattern in JavaScript. And that actually, particularly on the server, simplifies the state quite a bit and allows us to get rid of a lot of these mappings. Um, but let's let's go go through the, the the sort of functional way to do it first. So um, let's start. So you know w when I work on stuff like this, you know obviously I have my my dev development environment up and running. Um, you know you, you start. You know one of the ways I like to try to do things is just you know get one thing to work right. Like what what doesn't work right now, and you start to think about okay, well where where does this process start? What do I what's the first thing that's missing? So if I go to my my front end component. I can see I've got kind of a placeholder here for my my send messages call. So I kind of know where this is supposed to go. I have a message that I've already used run types to, to validate is in the right shape. And that's actually what I want to send to the server. What I what I don't have, the first sort of really obvious missing piece here, is I don't have a send method. There's no way for me to actually send this yet. Um, and if I go and I look at my context provider, I see that I actually am not really even providing any way to send messages. So right now I have this join method. That join method uh, takes room ID and it takes a callback. That callback is used for um, receiving messages. So this is a method that the context provider is going to call on the presentational component when it has a new message. Um, but I don't have a, a send method here. And there were a couple of different ways to, to remedy this. So, so, so one way to do this is I could just add a send method to my, well, actually I can just put the whole message in here, right? So I could just add a send message to the contact that was provided to the client. Um, and this would immediately, as soon as I implement that method here and add it to the context that I'm actually, um, you know, uh, putting into the context provider, this would immediately provide my, um, my clients with a way to send messages. But, you know, I mean, just just because this is, well, I, I would argue there's two reasons to do this a little bit differently. Um, one is, you know, it, it never hurts to try to encourage um, people. So if you think about this, the, the library here is really the context provider. You know, in theory, if somebody else wanted to use this for a project, they were gonna write the presentational component. So this is part of the public interface, essentially, for this, this, um, this Check component, and you know one of the things that we want to make sure people do because it's required is they actually need to call join before they send a message. Um, now you know when we're done today, we're actually going to see that you know you could still you know call send message to a room that you're not a part of, and some of these permission based things are things that we'll have to come back and clean up in the in the future. Um, but right now, the idea of sending uh, passing a send function down through my contact is nice, and some of you guys may have chosen to do this, and that's totally cool, but it doesn't really help drive home the point that you do need to call join for me. Um, one way that we can do that, and we can have some fun with you know, uh, TypeScript here, is we can actually return the send message from the join call itself. So essentially what we'll do is we'll force the client to call join in order to get access to this send message. 
Okay, so rather than adding this directly to my context, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the signature of my, my join method. And one of the things I'm actually going to do here before we go too much farther is I'm actually going to add um, some useful types here. So um, I'm going to call this send uh, chitter message. And that's going to be a function that takes a chitter message and returns void. So all I'm doing here is I'm setting up basically some type aliases here in, in, in TypeScript. Uh, these are particularly nice when you start um, working with, with function types where you have functions that return other functions. This is just going to help us, uh, you know, make things a little bit more clear. Now, right now, you'll notice that both my send and my receive message have the same signature. They're both functions that take a message as an argument and don't return anything. This one is going to be, I can now use to type this callback that the client is required to pass to the join function. Um, so that cleans that up a little bit. And now what this method is going to return is uh, a method that allows me to send a message. So again, currently they have the same signature, but you can imagine in the future that I might want to add different arguments or whatever. And so I'm going to, I'm going to keep these separate. One small, so, so one thing you're going to notice, and this might have tripped some of you up, if, if you're working with our continuous reloading development environment. This works pretty well, but there's one thing that it doesn't do properly. And the one thing it doesn't do properly is it doesn't update our copy over or update this uh, special TypeScript file that we have in the root of this project. So I, I won't bore you with the details. I spent a while of, I spent a long time fighting with TypeScript and various tools to try to get us to do this automatically. The idea here is that there are some types that we want to be public. So there's some types that are used internally by our, by our tools, and then there are other types we actually need to share outside of our projects, people that might be using. So for example, right now, one of the things that we need to, we want to be able to do is when I call join, what I'm actually going to get back is this function that allows me to send messages. So I need to update my presentational component. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use, you know, a reference to basically store kind of a private variable. Note that this is not state. You could you could have added it as state, and that would be okay, but this isn't really something that we need to trigger a re-render. This is just a piece of um, information that this component needs to have. Um, so let's, let's put a placeholder. The nice thing is each component subscribes to one room, so it can only have access to one send function. So let's add that here, right? And so what I really want to do is I'm going to call this my sender, and I'm going to use ref to... Uh, define this, and it's going to be undefined initially. But the problem now, okay, so I need to import use ref. That's not a problem. I can do that automatically. The problem now is that TypeScript is going to, um, what we're going to see here is that this is undefined. And if I, let's, let's see if it's actually smart enough to do this for me. Um, no, it's not, right? So, so essentially, uh, first of all, it doesn't know that the type definition for join has been updated. Let's just go ahead and do that. Um, but now it's basically saying, so A, it still thinks that the type definition is void because it doesn't understand how we've typed join because we haven't shared those type uh, definitions that we created yet. Um, and, and it can't figure out that this is a safe thing to do, right? So there's, there's two things. So essentially, these two type definitions that we just created, we want to export as part of the project. You would think there'd be a nice way to do this automatically. Like I said, I've looked around, I haven't found one. Instead, what we do is we maintain this uh, file right here. And all this is doing is this is essentially, um, this will list and export the public types that we want to expose for this project. So I've just added, uh, let's see, send shitter message and receive shitter message. So I'm going to add those here. Um, these are both useful. This is angry because I need to add some white space, so that's fine. Um, when you update this particular file, this is the only one that this is true for in this project, it will not automatically get uh, reloaded. There is, and here, uh, in order to get this to work, we have to run this build client um, command and, oh, uh, it's upset about something. Um, yeah, we'll, okay, we'll figure, we'll figure this out in a minute. Um, Anyway, one of the things that this command does, and actually I think I'll just do this by hand, is it copies over this TypeScript file. Um, I feel like I've got myself in a little bit of a, of a pickle here. 
let me do the following. Let's not do this yet because this makes this angry. Let's now let's try building the, the client and see if this will work. Oh, uh, it's still angry. Oh, okay. Sorry, this is actually in my client um, client code. Oh, sorry, it's down here. Okay. Um, yeah. So this this silly little bit of default context here. You'll notice again, and this is what you know. Sometimes TypeScript will make your life miserable. But one of the things it's complaining about is that. Um, this is just this stupid little placeholder that you end up having to register, but the problem is that I've typed this function as returning void, uh, which is no longer true. So if I need to do this, now this should build. Uh, oh, I'm still upset about something else. Oh, right, okay. Because the, ah, yeah, well, again, so, you know, those of you that are used to type languages, this, these are basically compiler errors that we're experiencing. And, and we're experiencing them because our type definitions are, are wrong. So, and this is one of the nice things about types is finding these problems for us, right? So again, and why these are small frustrations, this is actually really useful. Um, so one of the things that it's, it's complaining about here is that my join method, right? So remember, join is now supposed to return a function that allows me to send a message. And right now it's not returning anything. So what I need to do is let's actually put in that definition. And we could put a placeholder in, but it's actually so easy just to, to, just to do this properly, okay? So I'm gonna return a function that takes a Twitter message as an argument. And what it's gonna do is it's going to um, send this on my web socket. Uh, we're gonna call it send, and we're gonna do, we're gonna stringify this, and what the socket wants me to send are strings. Um, and that's it. Okay, so now you'll see this angriness is gone. Um, and and this, is, this is the real code. I mean, there's really not much else I need to do here, right? Um, the function that I'm sending back to the client just allows the client to, to send the message right over the web socket. And if I wanted to do some additional validation here, I could do that. Uh, one thing I can do that might be worth doing is just say, uh, use my... Um, use my run types definition to check the message to make sure that it's sane. Um, that's not, not a bad thing to do. Okay, um, cool. Quick question yeah, about David. that. So uh, right now what that's doing is it's just sending that message to the, um, like, so it's just sending that, that general message to the, to the server, but um, like, is there a way that you could make these functions more, I guess, like specific? Because that definition of like the send function is the same for each room. But could you make it such that like each room has its own type of like send function by valid validating like I don't know sending like the room information? I I'm not sure if that's like. A well, thing so that. so one thing so one thing we could do here, right, is we could check to make sure that the message room is set properly, right? So yeah. We could definitely do this, right? We remember this callback runs in the context of this definition, so I still have access to this room variable here. Right. Um. So I could do something like, you know, assert to make sure that, um, you know, I could say if uh, message.room is not equal to room, throw error, can't send, can't send to, well, okay, use a nice error message. So we've got TypeScript and JavaScript does have string interpolation. It's not quite as pretty as, as Kotlin, but it does work. Um, mm -hmm. You just, use, you just use this syntax. The, the braces are always required around the uh, or around the variable that you want to interpret, and you have to use back to set the string off. Um, cool. So we could do this. Um, we we could also so again, this is one of the things that's so cool about sort of uh, closures in, in JavaScript or other functional languages. We could also set this up so that the client didn't have to provide the room, right? Mm. We could add the room to the message. Now, there's a couple of things about this that would make that a little bit dumb. First of all, the client has to join a room. So the client knows what room it's in, right? So there's really no reason for us to add this information to the message. The other thing that would make more complicated is that we'd have to validate the message. Now that we're doing already, right? Yep. But we'd have to create a new message type that didn't have a room because we've already told TypeScript the room is a required property. And right. so- okay. Before I can I can treat this as a chitter message, it has to have a room, and that room has to be a string. What we're doing right now, if you go back and think about our presentational component, is we're checking the message, and that's good practice, right? We would hope that the beautiful people that use this would do that for us. Um, yep. 
I'm doing it again, just for sanity's sake. Um, but we can also do other bits of sanity checking here as well, right? So, so you're right, we could create a new type that didn't have a room. We could allow the component to send that to us. We could add the room ourselves and then check the message against the use run type to check the message and set it over the top. But there's no, there's no way yeah. in which this really needs to be more room specific than it already is. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, okay, great, great question. So I'll, I'll leave that in here because why not? Never take out error checking. Um, Okay, and, and that's so that's so that's it. So let me let me go back and rerun this again because it will work now, <laughs> or or it won't. Uh, let's see here. So now I feel like oh I didn't save it. Yeah. Kind of sometimes wish VS Code would auto save, but it doesn't. Okay, so now we're good. So so essentially this is just doing a a one time. This almost like running make or something. This is doing a one time build of our client library. But you'll see that tacked on the end here is a is a CP command. Some of you on Windows may need to change this to use copy file or something. But I, I'm manually copying these type definitions into our our output directory basically every time we run the command, um, and that's just to make sure that, that they, they get shared. So now you'll see that okay. So now I should have access to the um, shitter. What, what did I call it? Uh, send shitter message. Okay. So, so this this variable is going to hold a reference to a. Uh, well, actually, let's see if it lets me do this. Yeah. Okay. This is going to hold a reference to the function that we're going to receive after we call join. And so, what we need to do is we actually need to set it properly. Okay. Um, cool. All right. So now we have uh, we call join. We get our send function back. And now we have a way to actually send the message, right? And we've actually uh, wired up things properly in our context provider. So the message should actually end up on the server at this point, right? We're actually doing the work. It's not a lot of work to do. We're to just stringifying it and sending it over the WebSocket. So let's actually see if this, this works, okay? Um, so now, you know, if you haven't looked at the server for a little while, you may not know exactly what was supposed to happen, but let's just make sure nothing explodes, okay? Um, and what I see, okay, so I don't see anything over here. Let me try reloading. I don't think, you're you, I don't think you actually use sender. Oh, right. Yes, thank you. I forgot to use that function, which is important. Okay, so let's call sender.current. Now, this is one little thing, you know, some of you may run across and have stumbled with for a few times. Um, we don't know if this um, if this is set yet. This is a this is a ref, right? So and it's actually not set until this uh, this hook runs, and it's also not set until we're connected to the server. So it's possible that this is undefined. So what you'll see is that if I just try to uh, call this uh, method, I'm going to get an error, and the error is going to say it, it's possibly undefined. Okay. Um, the the right thing to do here is basically to use a little bit of JavaScript uh, beautifulness, nope, I should spell right, right, and, and do that. Um, what does this do? So again, I mean, this is the one place where I wish sometimes you had this sort of compactness in, in other languages. This uh, left side will only be true if sender.current is defined, and then once I know that, then TypeScript knows that I can proceed with the right side where I'm invoking that as a function I'm setting. Okay, good. So now our message sending should actually run. Uh, and so what we expect to happen on the server, so actually we're getting this message now, which indicates that the data actually got to the server, which is good. Um, now, why are we getting that particular message? So, so again, what are we doing here? We're working our way forward from, so we basically, we worked on the presentational component. We worked on the client side library that's in our context provider. I no longer need my, uh, my set messages because I'm no longer using the state provider, so I can get rid of that there. It's a little bit of cleanup. Now I'm actually at the server, so now I actually have to figure out what I need to do on the server in order to get this message distributed properly. Okay, right now what I'm doing, what's happening is I'm seeing this message down here, and the reason is I haven't put a arm in my if statement to handle the case where what I'm receiving is actually a shitter message uh, from one of my clients. So let's yeah. add that. Yeah. There's a uh, Harsh had a question in chat. Uh, okay, I'm not watching the chat. Let me see if I can pull it up. 
Do chat. Yep. Uh, I still don't. Oh, there it is. Um, I don't think you can do the. Yeah, I don't think this syntax works. Um, does the TypeScript have null checking? Um, well, TypeScript, the, the reason why we got that error is because TypeScript knows that that variable might not be defined. Um, there is, yeah, so in certain cases, Davis, you can do, you can use the optional property syntax. You can't use it in front of a method indication. Um, so if I was just trying to get a, like, if I was trying to chain calls to that, let's say I, I wanted to go a couple more properties deep, I could use this new optional property syntax. But um, yeah, we can try it. I, I, I wish it worked. It would be a little bit prettier. Let's see, where did, where did that go? Um, that was in Chitter, yeah. I think. That's in Chitter, yeah. OK, so yeah, what, what, you want, what you want to work is this. Uh, and does that work? Oh, no way. Uh, no, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, yeah, this is a syntax error. Like, this, this is why we're getting this error. Um, so unfortunately, that syntax doesn't work yet. Maybe it will at some point, right? Um, but but again, the reason why we're forced to use this, uh, which I don't know, maybe some people don't like this. Maybe this is this sort of kind of like one little bit of JavaScript cuteness, right? It's just a way of, of doing single line null and undefined checking. Um, but the reason why we have to use this is, is because TypeScript knows that it's possible that sender.current is undefined at this point. Um, good question. OK, so let's go back to our server side code. And now what we're doing is we're going to add, uh, we're adding an arm here to handle cases where what we're receiving is a shitter message. And now let's just put a little bit of a, well, how about this? We'll just log the room um, when we get that. See, our server should have restarted, which it did. Um, Let's we'll send another test message here, and you'll see that we got a. Now, the message contents are another test, the message room is the test. It's a little confusing. I probably should use a different room name for our, for our testing code. Okay. Let me turn off IntelliJ. Distracting me. Um, all right. So now what we actually have to do is, is distribute this message. So the server has received a message to a particular room. And, you know, eventually we're going to have to do some error checking here. We're going to have to figure out, can this client send to the room, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but for now, let's just do the fun part. Let's just get this message sent across the web socket that it should be sent. To. So keep in mind, we're maintaining a couple of different mapping up, mappings up here. So we know how to get a list of client IDs from a room ID. And we also know how to map client IDs to web socket. So we're going to use both of those capabilities here to essentially figure out in a few lines of code what web sockets do I actually need to resend this message on. And remember what we said last time, we're gonna send this back to the client that sent it. We're not going to, uh, now, now again, in the, in the future, you guys might wanna play with this a little bit and have some sort of way for the, it, it to, the client to show some dialogue when the message is sending, right? But for now, the uh, sender of the message, we're going to treat the same as every other connected client. It's not going to display the message until it receives its message back from the server. Okay, so first thing we need to do is we need to get a list of client IDs. And what we, and that what we need to do is get the, so last time, remember, we changed this to a double level map uh, to make this code a little bit easier. But now what we need is room to client IDs message dot room um, and if that I, I think actually object dot keys will always return even if room decline ID is just undefined. Um, well actually here's what we do. Let's say if that's undefined just give me the keys of an empty object. So if um, if there's no clients in this room now again, if there's no clients in this room, something's wrong, like a client is not observing our protocol properly because they, they should have joined the room before they send a message to it. But we're not enforcing that right now. So it's possible that they try to send a message to a room that they're not a part of and that nobody is a part of. Um, so either one of two things is gonna happen. Either we're, either we're gonna get an object that is a record of strings to Booleans where the strings are the client IDs that we want. So we pull the keys off of that. 
If that's undefined, then what we'll do is we'll throw in an empty object here. Just to make sure that object.keys doesn't barf. Object.keys may work fine if you give it undefined. I don't know what it does. Um, well, you know what? This is JavaScript. We can check this easily. So we'll just do, um, let's try giving it undefined. Yeah, okay, it doesn't like that. So this is better. Okay, so now we have a list of client IDs. Um, and then what we're going to do uh, is we're going to do client IDs that for each. This gives us a, uh, this is again sort of a functional form of a loop. Um, we're getting each client ID in the list. Um, and what we need to do is look up its WebSocket. Um, so we'll do client ID to WebSocket. Uh, and we'll pass the client ID. Um, and now here, now here's a, this is a good question. I don't know if it's going to, again, what I want to do is I actually want to call, um, well, yeah, so here I can use the optional property syntax. So it's possible that, again, somehow the state's gotten corrupted and I, there's no entry. Now, again, if I am my server side code is correct, I should never have a case with a client ID and a room to client ID map, but it's missing a WebSocket mapping. Um, maybe this could happen for very, very brief points in time when I'm closing a connection, right? Um, but anyway, so I'm assuming that this is going to get me to a WebSocket. If it doesn't, the optional property syntax here will help me out and this just won't execute. Um, and now I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, restringify the message um, and off it goes. So that, that'll do it, um, we hope. So now let's get rid of this logging. We should start to be able to see something happen and save the code so the server restarts. Okay. What's the difference between emit and send? Uh, nothing. Okay. Um, I, I, I think, so actually, hold that question because um, when, when we go through the event emitter example, mm -hmm. event emitters, so I think this is just a naming collision. Event emitters have an emit method that allows you to emit to a particular channel. I think WebSockets are essentially event emitters, but, oh, wait, no, no, no. This, it, WebSockets behave like event emitters, uh, okay. but I think because it's a network connection, send is a more traditional term, right? Sure, um, right. Yeah, so I think that's just where that, that came from. Okay, but we're gonna send this message. And now, so now we've, we've started the presentation of Component, we, we, we sent the message up to the context provider, it's sent over to WebSocket, the server is now sending it back. Um, yeah, I don't, somebody, somebody can check out that set over for link and try to figure out what the, what the difference is. I'm, I'm not sure, there, there, there may be a difference. I shouldn't say that they're the same. I'm not sure that they are the same, but uh, I think send is gonna do what we want. Okay, so now let's, head back. So, so this is the next thing that's going to happen, which is that I'm going to be in my, um, remember the client also registered its own event listener, which is quite similar to the server. And right now there's actually no arm for anything other than a rooms message. So let's, let's do a couple things. First of all, let's add a warning message where we received unexpected message of type and then we'll put Message.type. So this is basically going to handle the case where our server-side code isn't ready to doesn't got a message with the type that it wasn't expecting. Um, okay, so that's good, and now that should hopefully allow us to see something happen once this rebuilds, right? Um, yeah, there we go. So you can see I've got a warning in my uh, browser-side console that's saying that I'm not expecting a, a message of type message, um, which is, um, which is, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll add a check for this and we'll add the code here. But this is good to have in the future in case uh, things get, you know, things get broken with some of our protocols or something. Okay, so now what we want to do is we actually want to handle our chitter message. So this is a case where we're going to, re we've received a message from the server and we need to redistribute the message to, uh, you know, clients in that room. This is our goal. But now, again, we're, we're a little stuck here because we don't know what clients are in that room. We're, we, we know what rooms this, this page or this tab is part of because we have this rooms array that we're maintaining. 
but we are now, now our, um, our sort of, now this piece of client side code has some additional work it needs to do, right? Um, in the server, we had already set this up a little bit, but on the client, we haven't yet. So we're gonna have to add some state. So what we need to know is we need to know for each room what uh, callbacks have been registered. So when the join function is called down here, remember that the client is sending us a, an on, it's sending us actually two parameters. We're only using uh, one right now, but it's also sending us a function that's supposed to be called when a message comes in on that room. And so far we're not using that, now we got to figure out what to do. Okay. Um, one thing we need to do with it is we need to associate it with that room. And so here's another place where we're going to kind of we're going to have a mapping that, that we need to set up. Now I'm going to hoist that. We, we could put that mapping right here. I'm actually going to move it above this piece of code because we're going to need it in our uh, message handling. So essentially, this um, this code here is going to need to figure out what clients are in the room and call the callback for those. So now let's uh, set up something, maybe we'll call it room receivers. Uh, and again, this is gonna be another case where we're gonna use, use ref. This is a, um, this is a mapping. Uh, it's another mapping type. So it's a record that maps room ID to, now here's where it's gonna be nice that we had this type that we created. It's actually an array of chitter message receivers um, and why are you annoyed about this did i i not used record in here before uh, do, 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 do. you have to set it to a default empty object maybe i do let's try that no it's set with something else for a reason Oh, oh, just, oh no, 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 sorry. One extra care. There we go. Yeah. Boom. Okay, perfect. So this variable is going to store this mapping between room IDs and functions that can be called when we receive a chitter message. And so down here, this code is going to look a little similar to some of the code that we wrote on the server. Um, when the client uh, joins the room, what we're going to need to do is we're going to say if uh, room receivers, room, and this is another place where we can just use like a nice undefined check. So essentially if this is undefined, then I'll say room receivers, room is equal to uh, just an empty list. This is, uh, why are you angry with me? Uh, not sure why this is happening, but we'll come back and fix it in a minute. Uh, room receivers room that push on receive. So this is now. Uh, oh, sorry. This is a wrap, so I have to use room receivers dot current. Okay, so I'm updating this. And then okay. Um, one thing I want to just comment on here, because because again, this is probably so, some of the idioms here are probably a little bit confusing for people. So some people might be wondering, why can't I just do this? Why can't I just do uh, we'll just say record room ID to receiver uh, to message array, and then I'll just set that to be like this, right? So why can't I? And I need another chart again. What's what's the difference? between, oh, I need to put the type in the right spot. What's the difference between this and this, right? And this is one of the places where the, the functional nature of these React components is really important to understand. Remember, this function runs every single time either the state is updated or the props are updated. Every time the function runs, this initialization method will get called. So if I set up my room receivers like this, they get erased every time the function, this, this component is quote unquote rendered. Now again, this isn't a presentational component. It's not rendering any HTML, but it's still, the render method is still gonna get called. In particular, it's gonna get called anytime I connect to the server or reconnect to the server. It's also gonna get called every time somebody joins a group because it gets called and it gets rendered and what, what occurs from the rendering 
is that the context that is passed to the children that subscribe to it gets updated. And so if I do this, this mapping gets erased every single time the render happens. And that's not what I want. Now again, this is weird, right? I get it. Uh, we're, we're sort of writing this function as if it's almost like a class or something, but we have to remember that it is gonna get called multiple times. By using use ref, what happens, the way to think about it is this, um, this array only gets, this map only gets created once. It only gets created the first time the component runs. Um, and that's what allows me to save state in it, in this case, a mapping between rooms and callbacks that I want to persist across uh, refreshes of the entire component. When you look up and down our component, we're actually not using very many variables at all that are not called to use state, use ref, um, use callback. So use callback is another case where those will not get triggered. Um, these won't, my join method won't get created every time. In fact, it only get created once because it has an empty dependency array. Um, you can put things like, you know, on site, you, you can declare variables and do other stuff within your render method, but just keep in mind that code gets called every single time the component is updated. Um, so a lot of times if you have state that you're trying to maintain, you either want to do one of two things, either use state if that state should cause the component to re-render. So when you're building presentational components, if it's state that causes the display that the user sees to change, you have to use use state because that's going to now trigger an update of your component. If it's something that doesn't cause the component to update, then you can use use ref. So this mapping, for example, that we're maintaining is not something that's passed to the context. And so it's safe to use a use ref here because we actually don't need to trigger a, um, a, a new render. It should be a little bit confusing when you start working with functional components of React, particularly if you're coming from non-functional language. Um, all right, so now I've got this receiver mapping set up um, down here, and I think that's working. And now I'm going to use it. All right, so now what I'm going to do is kind of similar to what I did before. I'm going to say receivers is equal to um, room receivers dot current message dot room. Or, again, it's an escape hatch in case that's undefined. Shouldn't be. Maybe it is. Uh, I'll just pass in an empty array. And now I'll say receivers dot for each. Um, now this is, now keep in mind, what's in here is a function. The function is something that I should be able to pass this message to that I just released, uh, received, because now I know that it's a chitter message. There it is. And that's all we have to do. Okay, so now let's see what happens here. I actually don't remember what the, the client's actually gonna do when it gets one of these messages, but we're, <laughs> we're about, to, about to find out. Uh, what is it, there do I do this? Oh, it actually, okay, it's, it's trying to do the right thing. It turns out that this isn't quite correct and we'll see why in a sec, but it's close, okay. So now let's write a message here and we'll see, look at that, message appears in both chat. So, so what's wrong with this? Um, you know, people can probably notice it. Uh, so the problem here is that stuff is backwards in the sense that new messages are going to the top, old messages are, are staying at the bottom. The reason here is just this, it's just a little bit of, of uh, this is a mistake. So we're, we're, when we call m.concat message, we're adding the message to the end, but our presentational component is actually rendering the messages in reverse order. So what we need to do is just flip this around. An, an easy way to do this using uh, a nice kind of clean, easy way to do this, oops, sorry, using uh, JavaScript array spread syntax is to do this. Um, if you are creating an array in JavaScript and you have an existing array, so set messages is an array. If you're creating an array and you want to concat that into the array, you can use this spread syntax. So you do dot, 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 and that gives you all the contents of M with message then appended at the end. I think, unless I got this backwards again, this will work, um, and it doesn't because I got it backwards again. So actually, we need to put it like this. Um, Try one more time. One of those things is just the easiest to figure out by through inspection. Okay. All right. Cool. So this works. So we and, and you know again if you uh, if you run this in another 
If you run this in another tab, you'll see that the messages are being duplicated across the tab. Now, the new tab doesn't see the history of old messages. That's something that we'll, we'll, we'll fix down the road a little bit after we add server persistence and do some other things. But, uh, but any tab can send messages to this. And if I open this in, Fire, in Firefox or some other web browser, it, that, that would also work as well. It might look a little different, but, but the messages should be sent around. All right, questions at this point. Uh, so when I tried to, to tackle this issue, uh, one kind of approach that mm -hmm. I took was I had the client, instead of storing an array of these like receivers, I just had the client store like a object that contained mappings from a room and then the messages within that room. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, you know, so you'd have like test room and then each value would be, you know, a, a unique, you know, message in that room. Um, and like, uh, what's the advantage to using this like, you know, receiver that sets the room state of the component versus keeping the client, you know, yeah. the state of the components in the client? This is a good, so, so I guess what you're saying is, can't my, um, can't my context provider store the state of all the rooms that, that yeah. people are, and, and you could, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely a valid way to do that. I guess mm -hmm. the only thing that I would point out, and again, like, I, I, I'm just saying this just to point out as a difference. I don't care, I don't care one or another, and I don't think I'd have a big yeah, yeah. impact. Is that the result is now that any messages sent to any rooms are going to cause the context provider to have to re rent it. Mm -hmm. Right? And so if you think about where the, so, so on some level in React, where state lives can determine how many different types of components get refreshed at various points. So when the message state lives in the presentational component, um, basically, so if I look at what happens when a message comes in, right? So let's go back, let's go look at our, our Twitter or context provider and see what happens when it receives a message. So mm -hmm. it calls, it's using this private state, it goes through and it calls this callback. This will not cause the component to render my contact provider, right? Right, okay. Um, and so, there is some overhead to this because if you re-render the context provider, essentially what, what React has now to do is figure out are there, what are the side effects of this, right? Um, and so sure. essentially it's gonna have to re, the other thing that's gonna happen too, Davis, which again, like performance is always the last thing on my mind when I build in stuff like this, because who cares, right? Like, but if you have different components that are subscribed to different rooms, they're both gonna have to be re-rendered so that React can figure out like, because React doesn't know which one is listening to each room, right? Yeah. All React right. noticed that, okay, there was a change to the context that's provided. That might cause them to change. So basically, React has to render both and look at the output and use that to figure out whether or not there's this, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, the typical use model for this is you're going to be in one room, right? Um, but, you know, we're, we're building this in a way that allows multiple rooms to code. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's certainly, it's certainly a valid model. Right. Cool. Other other questions. Okay. So let's let's do the following. So I, I already have a, a, a check in for this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do just gonna go I'm gonna rewind to the beginning um, and let's tackle this differently. Uh, let's let's try a different approach. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a way to do this using this, this concept of what's called an event emitter. An event emitter in, in uh, JavaScript is, on, on some level, you can almost think about it, and one of the reasons why it's a nice fit for this particular project is if you think about the code that we wrote on the server to redistribute uh, the data to the multiple clients, event emitters do that automatically. So an event emitter allows you to do two things. First of all, you can add uh, callbacks to it when you want to receive a particular type of event. And then you can also emit events through that event emitter. So when you emit an event into an event emitter, all of the, you basically uh, give a string that identifies the kind of event it is, and any callbacks that have been registered for that event are run in the context in which they were registered, okay? Um, so this actually turns out to be kind of a, a neat way to do the server-side component in particular, but we can also use it on the client, okay? 
So uh, let me let me just quickly run through how to do this. And, and again, this is probably you know a little bit of a different approach than than some of you took, but I think it's it's kind of cool and it's worth talking about because I think it's a good fit for this problem. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to um, we're, we're going to change uh, the state that we pass down from, from our context provider, okay? So, and, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do the same thing where we exported the type, um, uh, I wish, wish I kept some of this around, send sugar message is equal to, so we're going to keep these because we're going to want them. Um, now, I don't think I need a receive sugar message anymore, and, and here's why. So my join method, is now not going to take a second parameter. It is going to return a, a function that allows me to send messages, but it's not going to receive messages, okay? Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import uh, event emitter from events. Now, there's one, uh, man, you run into stuff like this, it's just part of being a software developer. There's one nasty little bit of crap that I have to do just to get um, our client side bundler to deal with this. So one of the things you'll, you'll quickly realize that makes JavaScript so fun is that there are two different environments that, that JavaScript or TypeScript can run in. One is the browser, one is the server. And they are similar enough that you can write code sometimes and sort of forget what you're doing and whether or not it runs on the client server. And what you've seen is the code that we're writing looks very similar on the client server. On the client, we're using React, and so the, the code was a little different because it's React, but that's not really the reason why it looks different, right? Uh, in many ways, TypeScript you write on the client is TypeScript you write on the server, and that's really nice. There are some differences, though. So, for example, the client uh, browser clients ship with a bunch of stuff sort of built in. Um, so does Node, right? And so there's some, you know, if you think about the kind of library, the, the, the built-in stuff that you can expect on the client versus on the server, there's a lot of overlap, but there's also some areas around the edges where things are different. So, for example, uh, the client doesn't really have any notion of a file source, right? When you run in the browser, you can store a state using set storage and local storage the way, or session storage and local storage the way that we did last time, but there's no real equivalent of a file system on the client. On, in, in contrast, on the server, we do have a file. Um, event emitters are things that are supported on both client and server, but for some reason I had to do this little weird bit of configuration update to get this to work uh, with Rollup. Um, okay, anyway, so, so now I should be able to import this. Um, an event emitter is actually something that allows me to create, this is a method that allows me to create an event emitter object. And I'm gonna add that here, I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna I'm just gonna call this messenger, and I'm this is a uh, this is a call to use ref, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create new event emitter. Okay, this is my event emitter instance now. Um, it contains something that I can both add callbacks to and emit events into. Um, and so let's, and, and this is also something that I'm going to add to the context that I provide to my children, because this is now going to be, well, to, to my subscribers, this is now going to be the way that they listen for messages. Uh, sorry, this is an event. Okay. Uh, there, there we go. And then this is going to be angry down here. Let me just do this, I'll say. Um, you guys have been wondering what this is. This is just some stupid piece of default context that for some reason you need to maintain, like for testing or something. It's kind of coming down. Okay. Um, oh, so this now again, we need to make the same change we made before. It doesn't return void anymore. Okay, good. Um, all right. So now we've created this event emitter and we are passing it down. Now, now you'll see there's an error down here because we actually have to, we've told TypeScript the context contains an event emitter and now I have to actually. Uh, provide it, and because it's a piece of use ref, I have to do, uh, I have to use messenger.cur. Okay. Oh, and then there's there's something wrong with my join function, which it also needs to return a, serve, a message. I'm going to do the exact same thing I did before. Um, this is sort of nice review. Sending a message is not changing. Sending a message is going to work the exact same way. It's really more the receiving side um, that's going to be different. So we're going to do connection. 
current dot send message. Oh, okay, we're gonna apply it. Come on. Okay, good. So now now everything's happy. So my join method is returning a trigger message sender. Um, but now what's different is I'm passing down this, this messenger event. Okay, so, so how is the, let's see how the client, let's go and fix our client first, uh, or the presentational component. So I still need to do the same thing here, where instead of this, I need to save my sender object. So I'm gonna put that up here. Uh, sender is equal to use ref. And I need to do the same dance that I did before with the Twitter message sender message. So again, some of this I should have I should have, probably should have kept the old code around. Some of this is review. Uh, send to the message, okay. And then I need to do the same thing. Uh, nope. There we go. Hopefully this will actually build by dying. Good, okay. So now this guy should have, I should be able to get this. Good, I've got it. Uh, I need to import use ref again. Got that. Awesome. Okay, cool. And I'm gonna call sender. Now you'll see it's complaining about my use of join and the reason why it's complaining about my use of join is join no longer takes a callback because that's what I'm gonna use this event emitter to do. Okay, so I'm setting up my sender. I'm going to call sender.current, same thing I did before. I'm gonna use that to send my new message. I don't need this to put my dependency array anymore, good. Okay, so now the question is, how do I actually get messages to, uh, to, the, cl to, to the client? Um, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do the following. So uh, my, uh, first of all, I need to grab that piece of context that's being provided. So there's this thing called Messenger now that I could use. And when I join the room, I'm also going to do this. I need a messenger dot add listener. And you'll see this looks a little bit like my WebSocket now, right? Because WebSockets essentially kind of follow the event emitter pattern. So when I add a listener, I need to tell it what I'm listening for. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to send messages for a particular room as events to that group, okay? Um, and now what I need to do is I need to, uh, I need to register a listener for this event. Um, and in order to do, I'm, I'm just gonna basically do the same thing I did before um, where I add this, and of course I'm gonna do it backwards, um, but that's okay. Uh, and I think, Right, okay, so now I have to, now it's asking me to add something to my, my array. Okay, so when, so, so now the process of joining a room essentially has two steps. First is, the first one is I call join. The second one is I add myself to this, to this message list. Now, I could, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I could have passed the callback to join and my context provider could have added the, the, the event listener for me. That would have also worked fine. Um, you know, again, six of one, half dozen the other, right? And I guess, to be honest, I sort of like the first, I, I like the way I'm not doing it better because in that way you don't have to pass the messenger down to this context, but it's gonna work fine. Okay, so uh, when I join the room, I tell the server, I'm telling my contact provider I wanna be in that room, I get a reference back to a method that I can use to save, and I can add myself to uh, this messenger. Um, event emitter that the client is going to use to, to, to push messages back to me. Okay, good. Let's go look here and see what we have to do um, on, the, uh, on the client. So remember, when this is on the client side library, so my context provider, remember before, the context provider needed to save this mapping between callback and um, room. Right. So when I joined a room, I needed to take that callback argument and put it in this array. The cool thing is we don't have to do that anymore because the, this message or this event emitter is going to do the right thing for us. So now we're going to add our, um, we're going to add our handler for, for these incoming chitter messages. 
let's get rid of the logging. And all we're going to do is we're going to do messenger.emit message.room message. That's it. Oh, I need to do messenger.current.emit because I'm using a, a ref. Okay. Um, and I need to be able to write conditional statements, which you think I'd be able to do by now. Okay, good. So you already see, like on some level, this is a little tighter on, on the client, right? Like we, there's less state for, for this component to, um, to maintain. Um, like I said, we, we could have still had a pass the callback and that wouldn't, wouldn't have been that bad, right? We don't have to maintain this list of callbacks anymore because the event emitter is gonna do that internally, okay? Okay, good. Now I'm, I'm, doing that, I'm doing that classic thing that people do when they're doing these demos, which is that I'm gonna go a while without trying anything, so it's very possible that by the time we get this done, it's all gonna be super broken, but let's, let's just plow forward. Okay, now the cool thing is I'm gonna do the exact same thing on the server. I'm gonna import, import the same thing from the same package, which is also available to me in Node. Um, one thing I want to point out is that my understanding is browsers actually don't provide event emitters internally. What happens is that um, the, the code that compiles your, the, the program that compiles your code for the browser will automatically include the event package if it needs to. That's something the rollup does for us, basically. So that's, that's kind of cool. In, in Node, this actually is part of the Node ecosystem. So you'll notice I didn't have to install a package called events or anything like that. That, that, that should just automatically be something that you can import from. Okay, so now I've, I've still got to handle this case where I'm getting uh, a uh, incoming shitter, shitter message. Um, need to do something here. And, and what I'm gonna do is something that was very similar to what I did on the, oh, I need to set up, I need to set up my, uh, my, my messenger. So I'm gonna call, also call it, uh, use the same terminology, right? So this is again a new event emitter that I've created. Um, and here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna send, and I think I have to use emit room message. So I'm just sending this right back into, into the room. Um, now, so on the, on the server, we had gone a little farther down the road of like setting up these mappings and stuff like that. and and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that a lot, like one of the cool things about this, this approach is that on the server, a lot of this can go away, okay? So right now the server is correctly emitting the message to the room when it arrives, but it's not gonna end up in the client set because the clients aren't listening. So, you know, again, event emitters, you can think about it as, is almost like a distributor. You send something in on a particular channel and anyone who subscribes to that channel receives it. But right now, no one is subscribing to this channel, right? So if you have a event emitter and all anyone does is ever is emit to it, it's not that interesting. You need add listener because someone's got to hear the message and respond to it. That add listener is going to go in here, right? So more or less, what we're going to do is we're going to say messenger dot add listener message dot room, and then uh, let's do something fun with this. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to type these as chitter messages. For now, let's just log them. Um, but in the, in the in the future, we can do something something else. Um, okay. So, well, you know what? Let's just let's just this is so easy. Let's just like do do what needs to be done here, right? Uh, what needs to be done? I need to send this on my back on my web socket. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send it, and I'm going to say json.swingify, expect that swingify the message again, um, and, and that's it, all right? So now let's look at all the stuff that I don't need anymore. So I don't need this stuff, don't need this stuff, don't need this stuff, it's gone. Uh, it turns out I don't need these mappings anymore. Don't need these guys even, all right? Um, it, so so, the, so here, here's one way to think about this, but what we've just done, right? Uh, oh yeah, no, it's gonna be, oh wait, okay, I, 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 sorry, I need, I still need one of, I need one of these. We'll make it go away in a minute. Uh, I still need the client IDs to room, then, and then I need, I'm gonna have to rethink my cleanup code now. Okay, so 
one of the things we had to do in the past is when we, when we received a message, like down here, we actually had to, we basically had to figure out what other web sockets were connected and we had to send the message to the manual. So that required we figure out the, the we basically had to take this web socket, which starts off in the context of the client that connects, we had to save that outside of its context in a global variable so that when another connection needed it, we knew where to find it. The cool thing about the event emitter is it, it gives us a way to move data from the context of one connection to another connection. So when the connection that's sending the message calls message.emit, this listener is going to run in the same context of the other connection, any other connection that had joined this WebSocket, right? Um, and so it has access to the WebSocket that it, that it used to, to connect, right? So you can think of, here's what's gonna happen, right? When an incoming message comes in, I call emit on my event emitter, that queues up the message and then goes through and finds all the listeners that have been registered for this particular room. Um, and it is going to run add listener. And add listener is going to run in the context in which it was created. And this is, again, this really weird, important thing to understand about how, how Node and, and JavaScript work, right? So suddenly, I went from, and again, this is weird, I went from the context of the connection that sent the message to the context of the connection, of the other connection that called add listener. Um, okay, so this might actually work if the client side component is ready to deal with these incoming messages, which it is. Um, so let's give this a try. I probably screwed something up. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks like I'm getting a double send here. So let's try to figure out um, now that, uh-oh. Of all the bugs I was prepared to deal with, this is, <laughs> this is one that I am. Um, oh, I know why this has happened. Uh, anybody want to to make a hypothesis? There's one little piece of uh, one little thing that we need to do. We need to fix here on our server side code. Is it that it's sending the message twice because there's two rooms connected? Yeah. So each room is adding its own listener. So essentially, yeah. when each one of those components calls join, the client side component calls join and sends a message to the server, and so two uh, rooms get added. Yeah, two listeners get added. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna save a list, um, and this is actually not just gonna be a list, it's going to be uh, a map between room ID and uh, a function that returns void. Actually, it's a uh, chitter receiver. Uh, Receive Twitter message, and I need to uh, I need to go into my index here and also set receive. Now, actually, what we should probably do is is just move that to the type to the type definition file because this is now something that's going to be needed by both the client and the server. But for, for now, I'm just going to leave it alone. Um, so, what I actually sorry. I'm gonna, what I'm storing here is a mapping from room ID to a method. And I'm gonna tell you why we're using a method in a minute. Um, the reason is when we do a shutdown here, we actually need to, this call to add listener, we actually need to reverse it. We need to remove the listener that we added to make sure that uh, after the client disconnects, we're not still trying to, to send in messages. And so the way that we're gonna do this is, we're gonna, we need to do a few things. First of all, um, we have to take this function literal out of our call to add listener. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare it. Um, we're going to say this is listener is a function. Then we're just going to call uh, add listener. And then we're also going to say room listeners room uh, or message dot, uh, dot room ID is equal to listener. Uh, and now it's angry uh, because, oh, right, I need to type this properly. Okay, good. So now uh, what we're doing is we're, we're setting up our listener. This is now just a function literal. We call add listener to associate it with the room, but then we're also saving a copy in this map. Um, there are two reasons for this. 
first is that we can say if room listeners messages dot sometimes autocomplete on DS code is just like so exuberantly wrong. Um, okay. So essentially what we can do is we can say if this client has already set up a connection with this room, we don't have any work to do here. Um, maybe we should still send this message actually. So here's what we'll do. We'll say uh, if it hasn't set up the connection, um, then do this work. So set up the listener, add it, and associate it. Um, we'll always send the room's message back just for fun, right? You, you can imagine that you know you could do it either way, but sometimes when you when you have a particular protocol, it's nice to get a message back. So essentially, whenever the client sends a join message, we're going to send a room's message back, even if it's joining a room that's already part of it. Okay. Um, now, notice that this room listeners is essentially part of the state of this function now. It's not global and it doesn't need to be global because all this is doing is figuring out which rooms this connection has joined. Now when we come to our close method and we're actually shutting down our connection, what we can do is we can say object.keys uh, room listeners um dot for each this is a room that i'm a that i was my uh, my connection was part of and then i'm going to uh remove that listener from from the uh from the connection and i think i need to pass room and uh room listeners okay why are you angry about this Oh, fine. Great. Okay. So now, now we've got that. So essentially, when I'm this is I'm detaching from the um, from the event emitter. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this last piece of state because what this was doing is it was allowing me to associate client IDs with rooms, uh, but I don't need that anymore because I know what room this is in, and the reason I know it is I can just call object keys and I can pass room listeners and that'll so it's gonna that's gonna work exactly the same way um, okay so now we've actually handled two problems we fixed that double connection and we've also completely removed all of those mappings that we were maintaining before it's kind of nice you know uh, because essentially those mappings are now reflected by the internal structure of this event emitter so let's see if this works uh, we should see it does seem to work. Let's try it on another tab. Um, and it seems to work. There you go. Okay. So, so again, different, different approach to this. Um, you know, I, I would argue a little more idiomatically JavaScript, but that's just because of emitters is such a, a, a key part of, of this ecosystem. On, on another level, we're using built-in functionality to, to, to help ourselves, uh, to reduce the amount of state that we have to maintain. Um, and for this particular application, this is a really natural state as well. Um, okay, uh, questions about this particular, um, this particular approach? All right, um, so let me just go for a few minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll meet again on Thursday. Um, let me just sort of give you guys a little challenge to, to do uh, for that. So this is working, kind of cool. Um, next couple steps are going to be to deal with authentication and to, um, and, and that's all we're gonna do for, for the first time, for the first bit is just add authentication, like knowing who somebody is. Authorization in terms of actually figuring out who can send a rooms and stuff like that, we can think about in the future. Um, but I would say over the next week or so, we'll do two things. One is we'll, we'll add uh, authentication and identification to the system so that actually uh, when somebody sends a message, we know who sent it and we add their identity to the message. And then the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add persistence. Uh, to our server, meaning that the server is going to save copies of all messages. This will also allow us to, when the client joins a room, enable it to retrieve the recent messages that the, were sent in that room. Okay, so, so let, let me do a couple things just to kind of bootstrap us uh, for, for, for this journey. Um, 
All right, so, so the first one is let's talk about authentication first. Um, this is not, uh, so, so here's how we're gonna do this. First of all, it, 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 at a high level. Um, first of all, the, the, um, we're gonna identify people from the, from the perspective of the messages they send, we may still identify them by their client ID and things like that. But what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that anybody sending a message using this system has authenticated using a Google token. Um, okay, and, and here's how this, uh, we're gonna use some code that you know, we maintain for CS125. And basically, here's how this works. So when you log in uh, to, through using this login box, the, the box that, that we built, um, the result of this login process is that your client, now first of all, there are no CS125 servers involved in that login box, which is kind of nice. Um, you know, you'll see it's done very nicely. There's no, you know, if I logged in with Illinois, it would actually redirect me properly through SHIB and stuff like that. But, um, but if you log in without Illinois, it's, 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 it's quite pleasant. The only thing that's changed now is that my client now has access to a login token that it can send to our server, which will validate it. So the Google has essentially kind of given my client uh, this piece of secret information. When the client sends it to the server, all we're going to do is we're going to use Google's libraries to validate that token. And validating will extract certain pieces of information from it. One of the, the for our purposes, when we're building stuff for this class, the only thing we almost ever care about is the email address, because that's the key that we use to match people up with the grading page to figure out what kind of, you know, person they are from the perspective of the class. It's really the email address. That we use. So the work on the client side is, has really already been done for you. Um, the, uh, the environment, you know, the, the reason why we have this login box at all is because the environment, uh, your, your, your example environment is already set up uh, properly to use Google Log. The way this should work is that our client component, and I'm just going to talk you guys through this, and I'll kind of let you guys chew on it for a couple days. This client component right now requires two props. It requires a server, and it requires children, and the server is what it uses to connect, and the children is the content that it just passes through. What you should do is you should add a third prop to this, which is a Google login token or a Google token, you call it whatever you want. And that should be passed to the server when you connect. So if you look, um, and that's happening right here, right? So basically this is this connection query. Um, currently the connection query requires that you provide a client ID, a version and a commit. And that type is over here. Uh, sorry, that type is over here uh, in the connection query. Um, I'll just go ahead and do this. Um, let's call it Google token, and we're going to add a string, okay? So now, in order to connect to the server, I actually have to provide this Google token. Now, where does that, what happens over here? So, the, now that Google token, and, I'm, and I'll post some examples in, in, uh, on the forum for you guys to look at, but, but there are patterns that you can use from some of our other projects for doing this. The amount of code you need to use is pretty small. Uh, there's a few libraries that you need that I'll add to the project, um, but you know, in, in general, this is pretty straightforward. The what the what the client is going to do um, is uh, well, actually, hold on a sec. Let me think. Um, let me think about how we want to do this because I'm not sure. Okay, no, no, no. So, so we. Sorry, sorry. Let me let me go back and, and revisit this. Of course. Um, you definitely need to uh, provide a, um, well, okay, I'm, 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 I'm gonna chew on this a little bit more. There's, there's two ways to do this, right? One way is to assume that your Chitter provider is wrapped inside our Google login provider, at which point your, this component can use the context provided by that login component to get a token that it then passes to the server. The other way is to force somebody to provide it as a prop. For something like this that's required, I almost feel like it's better to force some, uh, someone to provide it as a prop. What that ends up looking like, let me show you an example. Uh, again, this is going back to kind of our master theme for the whole. So for example, here's my Google login provider. This takes its own piece of state uh, that it uses to identify this 
this client with Google. All of these components down here, the element tracker, the MACE provider, um, G doesn't have this yet, but it will. Actually, G does use it. Well, it should use it. Um, take a Google token uh, prop as an argument. Now, in both these cases, it's not required. Um, but in our case, it will be required because you know, we, we just, this is something that you need to be logged in to use, basically. Um, uh, I have no idea what that's about. Okay, so let's add Google token here, we'll add it here. And I will, um, I'll go ahead and, uh, and I'll adjust the mounting of this to get that token. Uh, to your component, right? So your component can assume that it's going to be past this, and, and I'll fix that after after we're done. All right. So what you need to do is you need to pass it. from the client perspective. There's not a lot you need to do. You basically include that token as part of your connection query or goal. On the server, there's like a few other things that need to happen, right? Uh, let me go. Let me pull up another project, and I'll just give you a glimpse yeah, I can save this, of what it looks like on the server. Yeah. Okay. I have no idea why. Uh, yes, hit yes. That's what people do. All right. So there's a couple of steps. There's a library that we have to use. It's called Google Auth Library. Um, again, it's not something we created. This is something Google provides. It makes the process extremely easy. Um, part of the process of enabling this involves getting a Google client token that they provide. This is not a secret. It's something that you can, and like, it can't be a secret, right? I have to actually have to share it with the client in order for this to work. Um, but essentially that identifies our client to Google, right? Uh, so that not only can we make sure that this is a valid token, but we can make sure that the token signed by our application. These couple lines of magic set up a Google client um, authenticator that are then used where? Uh, right here. Okay. So this bit of code um, takes the token, and here I'm calling it ID token, and it attempts to verify it. So you'll see this is wrapped into try catch. Um, if I don't have an ID token or I don't have uh, the Google login set up, I, I skip this step. But in our case, this is required. So we're gonna we're gonna add this so that. Um, if the client doesn't provide a token, well, if the client just, yeah, if the client doesn't provide a token, the verification step will fail because the token will be missing from the connection request. If the client provides a token, then verify the ID token, ID token should work. And verify the ID token gives you back an object that has all sorts of, this is not my code, this is not how I would have done this, but it gives you back something that you can call this get payload method on. That payload contains a number of things. I think there's also a name on here. Yeah, there's a couple other things. The only thing we care about is the email. So these two pieces of sort of, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, like I wrote this. I'm not, it's one of those things that just gets cut and pasted around the project, right? To, to be honest, because it's just, it works, it does the right thing, and, and it's, it's, this is pretty much all libraries. What's really happening behind the scenes here is that the first time you try to validate a token, uh, the Google client will actually, uh, I think, contact Google and send the token along and say, is the token okay? And then eventually it starts caching things because the tokens are good for a while. The token might be good for like a week. So it's not gonna check every time. That's actually really important because in certain applications, you actually can pass this token for every request. Like for GED, which is our little Java sandbox, we have clients pass the token with every single request um, because only the first time is it actually a little bit slow to validate because there's an extra, an, an, an extra network connection that's involved. Okay, so, so that's, that's where we're gonna, that's what's gonna get us the, the, the identity part. And this is really just sort of cut and paste cookie cutter stuff. Uh, you know, I'll install the library. Maybe I'll just even do this part because it's not that interesting. Um, the other part that's a little bit more interesting is adding persistence. Um, so currently, our server does not save any state persistently. Um, in fact, currently our server doesn't save any state at all. If you ask our server what the last message that it transmitted was, it has no idea because all, this, all, all that's happening is stuff is shooting through our event emitter, being distributed to clients, and the server is just kind of a distributor, basically. Um, and you know that's one model, 
right? I mean, you could certainly argue that there are certain cases where that would be fine, right? Like maybe the server doesn't have to save state. Maybe the server never crashes, right? Maybe, you know, this is like a, a privacy, you know, sensitive application where I don't want the server to save messages because that way, you know, if the FBI comes knocking, I don't have any state to share with them. In our case, we want to save state. One reason is it's data that we kind of want to keep our hands on. So we're going to save every message to a database. The other reason is this allows us to, when a new client joins a room, give them history about what happened, right? So give them the last 50 messages, or the last 100 messages or whatever, um, so that they can sort of see what was going on and catch up. Okay, so to do this, we're gonna use Mongo. We use Mongo for everything in this class. If you don't like that, then I don't know what to tell you. Um, that's, that's what we use. Um, and you know, this is this is where development environment stuff starts to get a little bit more exciting, which is that, you know, how uh, for local development, I'm gonna wanna have a MongoDB server running. How do I actually enable that, right? Once we deploy this, we'll use our actual real production MongoDB cluster, but for, for local development, what I want is I wanna be able to run Mongo locally and have my local thing connect to it and do the right thing, okay? Now, five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, you would spend a few hours installing Mongo on your machine and, and that would be great, right? I guess, except now that you have, you have one instance of Mongo that everybody's sharing, they have to think about who's using what tables and maybe one application needs one version of Mongo and another one wants another version of Mongo. So this quickly becomes a mess, right? You know, in 2020, do not ever, like, think long and very hard before you ever install something on your machine in a global way, right? I don't care what it is, you know? It, it, particularly like on a server, fine. On your development machine, probably not necessary, right? The reason is, and this is what we're gonna do for this project, um, this is a great use case for Docker. So again, I'm, I'm taking you over to another project just to show you uh, one way of doing this. So this is a, th those of you that aren't familiar with Docker, I can talk for a while about Docker, but, but you know, you can go find out a little bit on your own or we can talk about it on the forum. Um, Docker also comes with a tool called Docker Compose, which allows you to quickly bring up, so Docker is this idea of I can put an application to a container. A container is sort of like being able to run an application, but it includes things like files and also some other things that really provide very nice isolation of, from one application to another. Um, Docker Compose allows me to set up a whole development environment very easily because I can actually not just run one container very easily, but I can run multiple containers. In our case, the only thing we want to do is run Mongo. But in other environments, like this environment for another project I'm working on, I'm actually using another one of our CS125 microservices in my environment. This is containerized. When we get to the end of this project, we'll containerize our server as well. Um, but you'll see here that one of the things that I need when I'm developing this tool is, is Mongo. So what we're going to do, yeah, was somebody question or, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to go ahead and copy this over into our project. And then what we'll do is, oops, sorry, CS code. Um, So, you know, again, I don't trying to explain this in detail because I'm just trying to wrap things up, but th this file, which is YAML, uh, describes the configuration of one or more containers that we want as part of this particular environment. Um, what's cool about this is it makes it very, very easy to start and stop things when, when I want to. So uh, I'm actually gonna update this to use Mongo 4.2 because I just upgraded our backend servers. So essentially what this is saying, this is the version of the Docker Compose file. This says, um, when you start this environment, I want you to create one service called MongoDB. Here's the image to use. This is a Docker image URL. This is a container provided by a container provider called Bitnami that runs MongoDB version 4.2. Um, I'm saying that I want to expose a port on my machine that should be routed into this container. This is 27017, that's the standard MongoDB port. And then I'm saying in this particular case, um, I actually want this to store state persistently. And I'm, I've created a volume called MongoDB data down here, and here's where to put it in the container. Again, I, this probably didn't make a lot of sense. Some of you, that's, that's, that's okay. 
all right, what can I now do now that I have this, right? So again, I have not, I do not have MongoDB installed on my system globally. What I do have uh, is Docker and Docker Compose. And so what that means is that I can now, oh, well, I need to start them. I have these little start scripts for my machine because Docker can consume a lot of resources when it's not. So that is actually one thing to keep in mind. This is a problem on Mac in particular. Docker has some bug on Mac that causes it sometimes to go wild and, and eat up all of your CPU cores. All right, so I'm waiting. This is Docker starting. You see, I'm going to wait for it to, to finish. And then we're going to run it. Uh, so what's happening, again, I could provide this to you. And as long as you have Docker and Docker and Compose, this would work identically. So what's happening right now is it's pulling this container because I didn't have it locally, and now it's going to start it. So with one command, I brought up my a new part of my development environment, which is this backend server that my server is not going to connect to. Um, because I set it up on the standard port, oh, okay, hold on a sec. Um, So if you have a, a Mongo shell that you're running, I can connect to it. So I'm actually connected to, yeah, this is, this is, this is fine. Um, you'll see that, you know, I'm, I'm connected to my local instance. Uh, there, I can, I could create databases, I can create collections, I can browse those, this is all good, right? Um, again, what's really nice about this is that when I'm done, like, you know, when you're ready to put your work away for the day and do something else, I hit control C and it's gone, right? Um, because I set up a persistent container, if I start up this again, it's going to have access to the same data that it had before. So that's kind of nice. There is a way to wipe the volumes and make it start fresh. Um, but, but this is a very, very again, if you, some of you may have used this for development, some of you haven't, but this is like the right way to, to create development environments when you need to run services. You could use this for Postgres. You could use it for Rabbit. If you need a queue system, you could use it for, um, what's the, uh, I'll think of it. Um, you know, any type of service that your application might depend on. Raz, you know, again, just don't ever install anything globally anymore. Use Docker Compose. You can add four or five different services. One command starts them all up. Another command shuts them all down. Um, so that's how we do that. Uh, okay, last but not least, we're almost done. Um, oh yeah, so now you'll see that this is angry because it can't connect because I'm not providing a Google token, so we'll, we'll, we'll fix that uh, in, in future commits. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is just get you guys set up with an actual connection to the database, because again, this is the, the parts of this that are not super exciting. Um, so again, this is what I typically do when I'm, when I'm doing this. Um, just go grab some code from a previous project, um, get that into my server. There's a, actually, there's a few other things that are gonna have to change here. So I will, I'll update this and then push, push the code for you, for you guys. Um, oh, I need, actually need to, to add some stuff. So, so actually, this would this be kind of fun, those of you that have, that have not done this before. Um, in this case, I actually need a library. Uh, there's some there's some additional library code I need. If I go and look at my other projects, you'll see that uh, let's save on the back. You'll see that it's importing uh, pieces from this MongoDB uh, library, and then there's also this other one. So I need to install some some new parts of my project. How do I do that uh, in npm? It's actually really easy. Uh, this is npm install, and then I give it a list of package names. So I want MongoDB, and then I also want MongoDB URI. This is going to run. It's going to take a few minutes, and it's done. Um, and I also am going to want the types package. Somebody was asking about this before, where the type definitions for stuff come. I think it's just types MongoDB. It's usually a pretty good guess. The, this flag says that add, this adds this to my development environment. So, so one thing I'm going to point out is that this modified my package.json file. So this has added MongoDB, MongoDB URI, and also added the type package to the development dependencies of my project. So now I can actually borrow these same imports and just move them into my, into my other project, and everything should, should work out uh, great. Yep, so you'll see these are no longer. Now I'm going to call this chitter collection because 
Um, and some of this we can, we, we can go through either on the forum or next time. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll check this. And so, the, so these are our next two, um, two challenges, right? One is, one is to get the authentication. And, and then also, as, as we're going through and doing the identification, we might also add some features to our, to our um, client-side interface, like timestamps and maybe an avatar for the person who sent the message, just to make it look a little bit more fun. Um, and then we'll also work on persistence and uh, start to do some access control. All right, any, you know, I, I know I was sort of like blazing through the last little bits. Any questions about this before we, before we break for the day? Uh, yeah, so, so when you're using VS Code, it'll give you these nice little reminders if you don't have a types package um, about how to install it. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not. In this case it is, uh, so you'll see that that error goes away because we now have type definitions for it. Uh, types okay all right so again uh, I'll I'll provide some sort of you know uh, next steps on the forum and then on Thursday we'll uh, meet up again and, and get a little bit uh, a little bit farther down the road uh, I, I would say kind of like you know work on what you want um, at this point if you want to work on the Google stuff do that if you want to work on some of the MongoDB stuff do that um, uh, the the mace project that I keep looking at is a pretty good um, example of how to do that both on the client and on the server so that's code that you guys can look at as, as kind of an example of how to do it um other than it was, if that's good then i will uh, talk to you guys on thursday and i think davis and harsh wanted to chat about yeah just briefly yeah, you guys want to just do that now, and other people can listen in or take off. Yeah, yeah sure. Quick question after. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, Arjun, go. Oh, okay. Uh, for that variable name analysis thing, like, do you know when the fall twenty nineteen data will be ready? Oh yeah, I've, I've had. I think I have that data already. Did I? Did I never send you a? Uh, not yet. Okay, yeah, but, but pester me again. I've, I've got all the fall 2019 stuff already cleaned up and, and ready to go. Oh, awesome. I'll just send you another message. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. See ya. Actually, hold on. Let me, uh, let me turn the recording off. Uh...